I know you have to let a little bit of it sink in, but I'm here. All right, so we're good. I want to just point out these balls. Do I see these balls? And we have a ball. I have a ball for every table. Can you catch? Oh, catch there. Ready? Oh, let me get one over here. Oh. <laughs> three for three. There you go. Can you guys catch? We got some athletes in here. <laughs> we got some athletes in here. Okay, excellent. I want to point this out because you're going to get, there's going to be several questions on the exam that these balls are going to help you answer. This, if you notice on this ball, it says liability. All your balls are liability balls. You never want to answer a question that would leave this liability ball in your hands. You do not want to be responsible. Okay, and let me talk about questions that in the real world could leave that ball in your hand. Is this a safe neighborhood? Sure, it's a great neighborhood. Two weeks later, they get robbed after they moved in. Who's in trouble? You're <laughs> See the liabilities in your hand? All right, let's move on to types of ownership. Before we move on, though, you need to understand the ors and the es. Or, or, or is the give more. E, e, e is the gimme, gimme, gimme the property. Grantor, grantee, lesser, leasey, vendor, vendee, option or optionee. See how that works? Or, or, or is the give more. Between grantor and grantee, who's the buyer? Grantee, give me, give me, give me the property. Less so see who's the landlord? You guys following this pattern here? Vendor, vendee, who's the seller? Vendor. There you go. Optionor, optionee, who's the one that can decide to buy it or decide not to buy it? There you go. You guys got that. 
or 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 is the give or e e e is the gimme 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 the property here's the hard one people get confused on who's the bank huh? Huh? who's the bank i'm going to give you a hint because it's it's backwards everyone thinks the loan's not done yet but once you're a mortgage or a mortgagee the loan the loan is done who's the give or of the payment The give for of the payment is who? Mortgage or mortgagee? Mortgageor. Mortgageor is the give or of the payment every month. If the bank doesn't get their payment, what do they say? Gimme, give gimme, give gimme give the property. You guys follow that? Or is and or is easy to these. Guys, when I read contracts, I still have to say that to myself to the state. Or is and or is an easy needs or, or, or give or. Oh, really? Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Give me that. <laughs> you guys will get, you guys will get used to it. Nobody has ever taught me that. So and you're 20 that, years of real estate? Well, 16, 15, yes. Thank you, I'm so proud of that. Well, thank you. Well, you'll never get a contract wrong, huh? No, no, hopefully not. That's awesome. <laughs> you guys, and thank you so much. I'm sorry, I want to hug you, but I know we can't hug, so virtual hug. Okay. No, please. Thank you. That, that's very, I mean, I, years ago when I took on test, I can remember that that was part of it. <laughs> when you, okay, they have to hear you. Years ago when I took the, t the cells right. test, and I remember that was a part of it, and that was actually tough for me to remember that. So, yeah. That's an easy way to remember. That was a hard one for me too. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That you guys to this day I say that. I say I say it to this to this day. I, I can't take credit for making it up. I stole it, but I'm good with that. <laughs> it works. All right. Or 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 is the giver? Thank you. I'm glad that that means a let made the whole class worth it. Thank you. That's so cool. Okay. Oh. What was it? You said the bank. Oh no. Okay. Just press that button on the bottom. You said there was a difference between the bank and it was reverse. Um, some people call it reverse. Okay, so it, it, that's a question. She, it, he's saying, is it the bank? The bank's reverse. I appreciate that, Shane. That was an excellent question. Um, it's it, to me when I first saw it. Yes, it's reverse because if you look back, the or 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 is the giver. This is very consistent, and so you would think if the or is the giver, the bank's the one giving the loan, right? But it, it does reverse like that. That's a good way for you to remember it. It reverses because it's thought of as the or, or is given the give or of the payment and the EE. -E. But if you want to call it reverse, yeah, that's how I thought of it too when I first saw it. All right. So thank you for bringing that up. You guys good with that? You guys, you, you are looking smart. And I know you've been answering the correct answers the right way. And you guys, I had to tell you, if you have knowledge, especially the pre-brokers, I think I saw her name that's a pre-broker up here that I recognized from a sales class. I don't know if you want to confess, I think, I think so. Um, you guys got to forget all about doing the real world. All right, Brittany, forget about the real world of real estate to pass this broker test again, because you're going into that PSI La La Land that you'll never use in your whole life. Remember that? All right, so, and again, you have to answer some questions wrong, but I'll tell you which ones they are. And I got a couple of new broker questions I can give you too. Um, yeah, all right, so don't think so hard. Okay, who else has a uh, insurance, banking, real estate, property management, job? Insurance is big for this. All right, that's a problem. It's gonna be a problem for you to pass the test because you know too much. Try not to, dumb it down or you won't pass. All right, and I mean that. I know that sounds funny, but it's it's first grade level real estate. If you're at sixth grade business, it's hard. So you're gonna have to like bring it down. And and I know. Okay, so the mortgagor is the the mortgagor is the give for of the payment. So that would be the bank giving the money for represent. No, it is monthly payment. Who's oh, the so give for of the monthly payment? The owner. The owner. The, right. Sorry, the mortgagor state word is representing the owner giving right the that's right that's, that's right so the, excellent thank you okay. perfect give war is the one that's representing the payment so who would that be the owner right or the person who took out the mortgage mortgage or i know that's confusing but you guys got it 
I know you can do this. It's good today. <laughs> you guys, you guys are telling you the smarter you are, the harder this test is. All right, so don't don't try to bring in the real world. Who knows absolutely nothing about real estate when I came here? You guys are my highest pass rate, first time pass rate people. People with no real estate experience uh, seem to pass very quickly. <laughs> this exam. All right, so um, so congratulations. <laughs> All right, freehold estate. We're talking now. We're talking about your interest in real estate, or as if you talk about freehold, we're talking about your ownership in real estate. When you own real estate or have a freehold interest in real estate, you have what's called a bundle of rights. You have your ownership is for what they call an indeterminable amount of time. What that means is that you don't know how, that no one knows how long you're going to own it for. And we'll talk about a life estate because a life estate is a type of freehold estate. It's unusual but it is still a freehold estate. When we talk about the bundle of rights, we're talking about the right of possession, the right of control, the right of enjoyment, the right of exclusion, and the right of disposition, meaning you can get rid of it if you want to. Those are your rights. They might call it the bundle of sticks with ownership, or they might call it the bundle of rights with freehold ownership or freehold title. So freehold means you own it. If you say, if you see non-freehold, what's the opposite of owning it? but you live there, leasing it, renting it. All right, so freehold means you own it. If they say less than freehold or non-freehold, that means you're renting it or you're leasing it. Okay, so freehold is the highest form of ownership. I don't know how to move that little thing. I'll try to get that at the break. Uh, free, uh, it's, it's called fee simple. Freehold estates, fee simple or fee simple to feasible are the highest forms of ownership. You can prove it. You can give title insurance. There's nothing encumbering the property that people aren't aware of. Fee simple to feasible is the highest form of ownership with a condition. And when I say with the condition for fee simple to feasible, you're gonna, your deed is going to read something like this. You have a fee simple to feasible, which is the highest form of ownership with the condition, and then it's gonna state the condition. As long as the hospital who owns this property remains a nonprofit, I'm going to give you a gift estate. Here is the, the gift estate of the property for the hospital. It's yours as long as the hospital remains a nonprofit. Or I'm going to give you the zoo people. Here's the land for a new zoo. You own it, that's the highest form of ownership as long as you don't charge an entry fee to get in. Okay, so fee simple to feasible is life. Uh, a, a, an estate, the highest form of ownership, but with a condition. If you if you break that condition, what do you think happens? It goes back to the original grantor. There's got, that's why we did the or, or first. Okay, it goes back to the original grantor. So if that condition is violated, the property is going to revert back to the original grantor. So you're either going to get the prop, the hospital that has to remain a nonprofit or the zoo that gets to keep it as long as they don't charge an admission fee. Here are the forms, okay? So we're going from the type of ownership, freehold and non-freehold, okay, because non-freehold is renting, freehold is owning, to the forms of ownership. The first one is called severalty. And see sever, anybody see the word sever in there? To sever all ties, that's what that means. Tenancy by the sev severalty, if you sever all ties, that means you own it by yourself. No one else own owns it. You can own it, an individual or an artificial person. An artificial person is a corporation. A corporation is considered a person. I don't know if you guys knew that. Like Disney, the corporation of Disney is considered one person. Okay, so they own it ownership and severalty. If they ask you how a corporation holds title, ownership and severalty. Okay. Everything else is a co-ownership. Okay, so that's the only one you can own by yourself. Everyone other than that is a co-ownership. Here are your co-ownerships. You have in common joint tenancy, tenancy by the entirety of community property, and they're easier than they look. Tenancy in common. All right, without even reading the screen, don't even read the screen. Let me explain it to you. Tenancy in common means that I can have unlimited partners and we can have unidentical un interests. I can, I can own 
25% uh, of the building, she can own 30% of the building, she can own 50% of the building. It doesn't have to be equal. Our interest does not have to be equal. So, and you'll see that sometimes where uh, there's a big project and somebody can come up with like 30% of the property. So they'll get 30 or 30 shares or 30% of ownership. Okay, so tenancy in common, you don't have to have the same equal amount of ownership. And you get to sell your ownership, you get to will your ownership. It goes right in your will if you want. My will states that this property goes to my kid when I pass away. Or if you pass away without a will, it still goes to your kids just in a different way. So that's tenancy in common. A timeshare, anybody ever see, own a timeshare? You guys know what a timeshare is? Timeshare is like a vacation property where you own like two weeks or three weeks. And sometimes you can exchange them out with other timeshares all across the, the world. Basically a whole bunch of people own one unit. So, they own it as tenancy in common because somebody might have two weeks, somebody has three months, somebody has uh, five days. So it's unequal interest, but you still own it, you can will it, you can give it away. You have joint tenancies, the second type of ownership. And this is a tighter type of ownership where you have four unities and they call PIT, possession, interest, time, and title. <laughs> Four, you have that, what, what that means is you have the same right of possession, you have the same amount of interest. So now if we have three people, instead of having unequal, it's one third, one third, one third. Four, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter. Half, 50, 50. Three, a third, a third, a third. You have the same amount of interest, the same rights of possession. You took title at the same time, meaning ownership at the same time, and you're all on one title. So it's basically one D, you all own it together. Okay, so four unities, hit. It also has what's called the right of survivorship, joint tenancy with right of survivorship. What that means is if Jerry and I own a property together 50-50, if I pass away, it automatically goes to her. Even if I have a will that says it's gonna go to my niece or nephew, it doesn't matter. The fact that I own it is joint tenancy. It's joint tenancy with rights or survivorship. So it automatically transfers. On the test, they're going to say two people. They might say a couple. They might say a married couple decided to own property as joint tenancy. Why is that beneficial? I know you don't know yet, but I'll tell you. If you own or a married couple or anybody owns this joint tenancy, the property avoids probate. It doesn't go into court. It automatically transfers to the other owners. So there's not a hold up on ownership. There's no question of ownership. All right. So I know that me and Jim and our properties were joint tenants. So if one of our one of us passes away, none of my ears can claim it. None of his ears can, can claim it. It just automatically goes to the surviving person. So joint tenancy with rights or survivorship. If you want to break up a, a uh, joint tenancy or a tenancy in common, somebody uh, arguing with you, you can do what's part. You can do what's called partition or a suit to partition. And a suit to partition, if you're joint tenants, all right. Let's say that Sandra, Sandra, new name, extra name added. <laughs> Sandra, James, and Jerry own properties together. And Jerry decides she doesn't want to be partners with James and Sandra anymore, and they refuse to buy out her shares, and they're arguing with her, saying we're on the same title. She's gonna she's gonna do a, a, a suit to partition. She's gonna go to court, and the judge is gonna break up that partnership, and they're gonna release her. But just because they released her, these two are still on the same deed, and they still have that four unities: pit, possession, interest, time, and title. But when she sells her interest. She's going to sell her interest to Maria. To Maria. Maria is also going to be an owner, but she's not a joint owner with rights of survivorship like you two are because she didn't take title at the same time. So she becomes a, a owner in common. See how that works? Owner in common. Then you have tenancy by the entirety. This is husband and wife only. I don't even think this is used anymore. 
Uh, it used to give an extra protection against one spouse's debts on the other, but that doesn't work anymore. But the husband and the wife together make up one person. They're not a person, they're one person as they come together. On here, they're gonna say a, uh, they're gonna say an elderly man, because this is an old, old type of ownership. An elderly man went into a broker's office and he wanted to list the property. So he mentioned talking to the broker that he owned the, the title with his wife as tenancy by the entirety. He wants to sign the listing agreement. What should the broker tell him to do? Go home and get your wife because we need one person to sign this listing agreement. He's only half a person on that deed. So together they become one person. See how that works? They're half a person. You also have ownership uh, as community property. This is gonna be husband and wife. This is based on Spanish law. Community property, again, requires the signature. You're a full person, but you, you, you can sign everything, but everything needs to be signed together. You can't transfer property without the signatures of both parties. It's community property that's equal partners. When you have a community property or you're married in a community property state, how it works is, here's Jim, here's I, here's my husband in there, and me over here. I owned a fourplex, he owned seven units. When we got married, the day to marry, I still separately owned my fourplex. He still separately owned his seven units. He sold that seven units and he put the money in a bank account. That's money that was acquired after the date of marriage. What just happened? I own half, right? And then if I sell my fourplex, put it in the bank, he owns half. So anything that was acquired before the marriage stays separate property but anything that's acquired after the date of marriage becomes community property, equal partners, except, okay, here's an except. If Jerry's my daughter and I'm going to will her this little red convertible that she loved since she was 12 years old and I saved it, I kept it in the garage, I kept it in pristine condition. And in my will, it says, even though Jerry's married in a community property state, in my will, it, it says that this car is gonna to go to Jerry because she always wanted it. So here is the gift when I pass away. So when I pass away, she gets that little red convertible that remains her separate property because it was a gift for her. All right, so if something's gifted or will to you, it remains your separate property. If a husband dies in real estate, what they call dower is the female or the woman's wife's interest in the real property of their deceased spouse. Courtesy is the interest that a man would hold if his wife passes away. Very easy. Look at that. Dower. Did you guys ever see? I, I love movies where they have they have to pay the dowry for the wives. Was that coming to them? No, it wasn't coming to America. I don't know. They always give goats and stuff. Because <laughs> I never see those. You're worth two goats. <laughs> love that. All right. So that's your dowry and curtsy. I was thinking of a guy who's doing a curts, curtsy to a woman. This isn't on the test, but people usually ask, what are the community property states? The ones in red. Most again, west of the Mississippi. Mostly, except for the one up north. All right, I mentioned that life estates are also a fee simple absolute, the highest form of ownership. A life estate is Jerry gave me ownership of real estate for as long as I'm alive. When I die, it's going to revert back to her. Or she gave me uh, the ownership of real estate until I die. And when I die, it's got, the deed is going to go to James. And James becomes what's called the remainder man. He's going to own it for the remainder of the time that that property or until he wants to sell it. Pure entree B would be a life estate based on someone else's life. Okay. James gave me and Jerry... James is letting Jerry and I own this property as long as I don't die. So Jerry has ownership, but it's based on my life. So when I die, she loses ownership too. So that's pure entree B. That means for the life of another. So you have two types of uh, life estates. You have a remainder man where Jerry gives me a life estate. When I die, it's going to go to James. He's going to be the remainder man. Or reversionary where... Jerry gives me a life estate. When I die, it's going to revert back to her. 
Pura V. Again, life estate based on another. Okay, here's a new question that's come up with the life estate that you guys are probably gonna see on the exam is uh, Jerry signed a five year lease with me and my ownership of that house is a life estate. She lived there for two years and then I died. And my life estate went either, it went to another person or a reversionary. They didn't even go into that far. So I owned it while I was alive. What happened to her lease? Null and void, that's right, null and void, it ends. Okay, so when somebody's renting in a life estate and that life estate person dies, the lease ends. Okay, that's a new question you guys might see on the exam. You also have real estate that can be held in trust. That means it's being held on behalf of a third party. Okay, it might be held for children or, or people who are gonna get some of it at 40, some of it at 50, okay, held in trust. Here are your co-owner properties. Bunch of people own them. Okay, we're gonna start with condominiums. When you own a condominium, I know Shane said earlier that when you own something, you own the walls. You own, when you own a condo, you own the four walls, and then you own a portion of the common area, portion of the pool, walkway, parking spot. It is possible to have two deeds when you own a condominium or a garden home. You may have a deed for your four walls and what's in it, and you may have a separate in common deed with everyone else that owns there for the common properties, the walkways, the pools. So it is possible to have two deeds when you have a situation like that. So condominiums, there's your, your, second, your second deed would be the tenancy in common because it's all unequal interests. Now let's compare that to a stock cooperative. You guys don't have any stock cooperatives in Mississippi, but you still have questions on them. A stock cooperative are things that I've seen only in, in populated cities where there's a lot of pop, population, very condensed urban centers. And what it is, is it can look like a condo. It can look like a hotel. It can look like whatever. The people who live there and own that don't own the deed. What they, in a stock cooperative, what happens is a corporation buys the entire building and then everybody that lives there buys stock in the corporation. And depending on how much stock you have is going to uh, ascertain what your square footage is or what, how high up in the building, because the higher you get, the more expensive it gets. So it's considered personal property. And a stock cooperative, people don't own the land. They don't own the four walls like a condo, they own a piece of paper that you can pick up and walk around with. They own stock in the company that owns the building. And they still own, just own stock. So it's personal property, it's not real estate. The IRS does treat it as though it's real estate, but it's not because you own the stock in the company that owns the building. You also have a timeshare estate. Jerry, you said you had a timeshare? Unfortunately. I usually get goods or bads with that. Anyone else? I either hear yes or no on that. Mexico takes the Mississippi license to go sell timeshares. You guys are interested. I have a couple of people down there. I have to unlock the site for every couple of years so they can do CE. <laughs> it's like, okay. All right, so if you're interested in doing that. Okay, so timeshare estate. They might call it interval ownership. This is like your vacation home where you own two weeks or three weeks or four weeks or five weeks. Again, how do you think you own title on that? Tenancy in common or joint tenancy? Excellent, tenancy in common. Okay, and don't forget, I just wanna remind you, you treat uh, townhouses around here like condos pretty much, right? But remember, they're gonna call them garden homes on the exam. That's just an area in the country that calls them garden homes and it's on your test. Um, that's hard because you, know, I, you might see a uh, repair. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe tell you. I don't know if I want to tell you. Okay. The <laughs> mechanics lien, sometimes they call material man's lien in other parts of the country. So a lot of your names change. They didn't change the, the garden home though. Okay. You also have plan unit developments. They call the PUD. You guys have a PUD um, traditions north of the freeway where a developer went in and he 
decided to zone out a big area, got it approved, and over here, section 16, we're gonna have the schools. Over here, we're gonna have the industrial. Over here, we're gonna have the mall. Here, we're gonna have the single family homes up to 1,800 square feet over here. Single family homes that start at 2,400 square feet. Uh, here, we're gonna have multi-unit, so that you can do four units over in this zoning. Okay, so it's not one developer going in, it's a bunch of developers going in and building their own product and a, a whole development that's been planned out and zoned out for them. Plan unit development. We have traditions here in Southern Mississippi. Okay, and home, last but not least, homestead rights. Homestead your property. This is for the property that you live in, your, your primary residence. It's going to secure your property against any unsecured debts. If anyone comes after you, your, your property is protected. And it has to be your primary residence. Okay, why don't you guys take 10 minutes? You guys are struggling. Take 10 minutes and shake it off a little bit, okay? All of you, not just like one. 10 minutes, guys, bring some cold water. Drink some cold water, walk around, shake it off. 10 minutes. You guys good? You yeah, guys? we're good. All right, cool. All right, hope you, they're, they're sleepy in here right now. <laughs> All right, just yell out if you need anything. Thanks. You're cold? It's pretty, it's pretty cold. Cold outside. How many hours have you been up? 7.30 yesterday morning. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> if you need to go home and sleep, you know, just do that. I'll wait till you get here. Oh, no, 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 no. Your hours then. Maybe that's very admirable. Like I said, short term pain for long term gain. I know. I always wish I could get a short term. I don't know. Good for you. Mm.
I, I just trained this um, one girl. She was from the car. And then, like, um, she started doing it. Did you think I had coffee? She's like, I need coffee. I need coffee. I need coffee. I need coffee. I need my coffee. And she was like, crap at work. <laughs> Yeah, it might be because who has good eyesight? Anybody with good eyesight? Hold on, I'm going to have to end this just for a second so we can make sure we have the Zoom right, correct Zoom numbers. Meeting number? I can't see them. I probably wrote them down wrong. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? That's what you guys are up against. Good luck. Exactly. What? And I think the answers are on here. Yeah. But and look on the back. Look on the back. <laughs> I have it written down right. Oh, thank you. Because I, I couldn't see. So it is right. 
<laughs> go to Zoom. Go to the Zoom website. Thank you so much. Because I'm like, Zoom. Uh huh. Yeah. Go to Zoom. Join meeting. Join. The address is invalid. Can you go to Google and not Safari? Try if you can't get into Zoom. Try a different um, search engine. She can't get in on Safari. All right. Thanks, I for that. Uh, Rebecca, are you here for pre broker? She is. Oh, do you know? Well, no, but I know she. <laughs> oh, okay, very cool. Uh, Rebecca, I have um, a question, pre-broker question. I'll put it on the Zoom for you to have a copy of. I mean, on the Google Classroom. And I just, are you guys astonished by those questions? On the back is the answer. I also just uploaded to your Google Classroom new questions from people. It came from all over the country because you guys are taking the same exam with 30 other states. All right, if I get anything new, I'll put it on Google Classroom for you guys. So I started a new section. It's new on Google Classroom. I just uploaded new questions I got. All right. So you guys can take a look at them. They're pretty accurate. They should be pretty accurate. Just curious on the brokers. Whew. All right, here we go. Okay, ownership by business organizations. Uh, what is a partnership? It's an association of uh, two or more people. It's for profit. Obviously, you want to make money. You can have two types of corporations. You can have a general corporation, or you can be a general partner, or you can be a limited partner. Let's start with the general partnership. A general partnership is what you'll see in, in a lot of a lot of small companies I've seen where, hey, you guys want to open a business? All right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll work Monday, you work Tuesday, you work Wednesday, and then we'll figure out who works from there. Okay, basically, it's all the partners participating in the day-to-day -day activities of a business. And that's probably, that's very common. But you also have limited partners where a limited partner is, I always think that's the money man. A limited partner is the person that gives money, but you never see. The name's not on anything. Uh, they don't participate in running the business. I always, call, I always think of them as like the money person. That's what you usually see, the limited partner. An LLC, limited liability company. Anybody have an LLC? Those are real common. Yeah, oh, you do? Excellent. How many people do you need to open an LLC? One. one. Excellent. Okay, so that's going to be one of your questions. One. Okay, and that's it for that chapter. That was quick. So quick, it's fooling me. Excellent, guys. Wow, you guys are way ahead. All right. Guys, I just want to take a look at something here. If you guys are way ahead. All right. Oh, all right. You guys, this is, you're already, you're already two cool sets ahead of, of, a, of a day in a class. So this is a very short one. I don't want to move more forward than what you guys are already, because you guys are already advanced. All right, but you're advanced right now, but I know it's going to start slowing down because you guys are going to get start getting more vocal when this comes together, and we're going to have more stories from you. All right, that's why I want to go ahead with two and just at least do this one today. All right, but during the week, you may get out early today, but during the week, it probably won't be that way. All right, you guys good? All right, all right, two, government rights and land. What can the government do with your land? The government has what's called PEAT, or government rights in real estate. And it stands for police power, eminent domain, taxation, and it's cheap. Now I'll break these all down for you, okay? First of all, police power, 
It has to do with zoning. They control the zoning. Uh, a police power, you don't want a big factory, truck factory next to an elementary school. All right, that, that could be quite a problem. It also deals with building codes. You don't want uh, buildings falling down on you. And thank goodness Mississippi doesn't have rent control, but if they did, that would be another police power. So when they say police power, uh, just think, what do they do? Protect the public. So if they ask you if this is police power, whatever they give you as an example, ask yourself, does this protect the public? And if it does, that's police power. All right, you guys got that? As opposed to a deed restriction, okay, which we'll talk about later. What are building codes? Those are your standards for construction. Eminent domain, condemnation, and just compensation. This is one of the most tragic police powers I, I think I've seen in real estate. Uh, what this does is this gives police power to your state or your local government, has to be a government entity, who can basically take your property and pay you what they think your property is worth. They call it just compensation. And I know a lot of people who lost their property haven't felt it was so just. Uh, so only the federal, state, and local government can do just compensation and condemnation and eminent domain, take your property. Basically, they condemn your property, give you what they think it's worth, and then take it from you. When they do that, it's to uh, better the public. So basically, they, they, they used to take, when I first went to, well, in California, they used to take farms, orange farms, for freeway interchanges. Or a little neighborhood for another, a lot of more freeway interchanges. Okay, where they would take property because it grew so fast. But you guys are growing really fast here. Have you noticed that? How many? Two lane or four lane. It's crazy. How many of your? Just I just want to take a survey here. How many of your clients are from out of state? About half. Are they, a little more than half of the new buyers are coming from out of state. You you finding the same thing? Yeah. No. Yes. She's so shy. <laughs> Does anybody notice how traffic's getting kind of bad? You guys, Mississippi's growing like crazy right now. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see some of that going on. Okay, this, okay, this has to do with the lawsuit that's very famous that changed a lot of uh, eminent domain laws across the country. It's called Kilo versus New London, Connecticut. And uh, there's a, a B movie called The Little Pink House on YouTube for like a dollar. If you ever want to buy it, it explains what happened to Kilo, Miss, Miss Kilo. Uh, they took an entire neighborhood, but it changed the laws. She fought it all the way to the Supreme Court. And this is just somebody who talked about it on the Fox News one morning when I was watching it. Welcome back. A Connecticut okay. resident lost That's his true. Eminent domain ruling, very famous. The city of New London used eminent domain to get that land, promising it would be redeveloped to create jobs and boost the economy. It's the Kilo case. But 10 years later, the land is just piles of rubble, boarded up houses, and a lot of empty lots. Michael Cristoforo is one of the homeowners. He joins us live. Good morning to you. Good morning. Okay, this is that very famous uh, New London versus Kilo case. Yes, it is. Where the Supreme Court said, yep, uh, a town can take your property if it's, in their, if it's in their best interest. Originally, Michael, what were they going to do with all of that property? Well, they were going to build a conference center, a fitness center, biotech buildings, a hotel, uh, which was supposed to complement the uh, Pfizer pharmaceutical plant that was being built. Okay, so that was their uh, that was their high hope. Yes, that was their intentions. It didn't happen. Absolutely, the economy uh, the felt the bottom fell out of it, and they couldn't build anything there. And now, tell us the status of that land where 120 houses have been. Well, basically, the only thing that's living there is some feral cats. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's all weeds and rocks. Um, there's nothing. There's 80 acres of nothing. Okay, I understand uh, New London had a hearing on Saturday to try to figure out what to do with the eyesore, and they determined, you know what? We're going to make it a neighborhood again. In other words, they are going to try to restore what you had before, and here's a statement of the intent of the effort is to move forward in a way that can be mutually agreeable while not forgetting the eminent domain fight or its effects. So they kicked you out of your neighborhood. They were going to build something. It flopped. Now they're going to put a new neighborhood. Right. Well, basically what they're saying is that the property owners that live there, I mean, we had one family that lived there since 1895. Oh. And they're saying, 
hey, listen, you guys weren't good enough to live here. We're going to wipe the area clean, turn around, and now here it is 10 years later. Uh, the best use for this land is to turn it into a neighborhood because they're staying suburbanized. I'm moving back into the city, yeah. and they want something that's a walk into it to downtown sure. and everything you else. You want to move back? If, if we could have our property back, I, I would. You uh, want the city to give you the, the land Absolutely. Back? For what we went through, absolutely. I mean, it was our home. It was my father's land. It was my father's home. Absolutely. It was the see. ultimate land grab, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the U.S. Supreme Court made the wrong decision. I mean, look across the United States today. I mean, you know, New York has its big sure. problems. New Jersey, that's California, the big case that's going on out there. I mean, when they made that decision, it was a wrong decision. The floodgates are wide open, and we need to close those floodgates. Yeah, it really sounds like they blew it. Uh, Michael Cristofaro, we thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, great. Thank you so very much. What a story. Sorry you went through so much. Well, we, we need to do something. We do. All right. Thanks for telling your story. That case changed laws across the country. What happened was an eminent domain, an eminent domain, only the city, county, state, it had to be a government entity that took your property. And it was for the betterment of the people. Kilo versus New London case, the city was taking it on behalf of a medical company. So they could put the medical company there and get rid of all those houses. They claimed it was for the betterment of the people because their tax base was going to go up if it was a company instead of people. And that's why it was fought. It's famous. It's called the Little Pink House. That's why I had that pink house out there because the lady that lived in that house is the one that took the case all the way to the Supreme Court. And when it got to the Supreme Court, Justice Roberts, who's still there, who no one could believe he would do, but he voted in favor of. New London, Connecticut, that states can now take your property on a promise that a company makes to them that they're going to build a company there. So all these people started getting what what happened? It was unbelievable what happened across this country after that ruling came down from the Supreme Court. Companies or people were going out and getting their corporate licenses, forming companies, and then going to uh, city governments all over the country, mostly mostly beautiful areas like oceanfront property or ski property, all these different properties. And they would convince the city councils that they were going to build a hotel with very minimal evidence. So basically they didn't even have any hotels, companies ready to build. And the cities were taking oceanfront properties from people. They were taking ski areas from people. They were literally taking properties all over this country under that statute. It was unbelievable. So many of those neighborhoods till today are just fenced off. And, and it's tragic. I, I remember watching that and they would interview some of the people, especially a little oceanfront company, a uh, city in, in Florida somewhere, where the, again, the families were there for a long time. These people could never buy today, today's market where they lived, but they were given very little money and forced off on the promise that something was going to be built there. And it was terrible. What happened was to overcome that, every state came up with their own eminent domain laws to offset what the government and the Supreme Court said. And I believe in, in the book that I have here in this section, I, I gave you an excerpt of Mississippi. Mississippi was one of the last states, but we do have it. And uh, in Mississippi now, they can only take it again to betterment the people and that these, whoever takes it cannot sell it for 10 years. Because what was happening was these people were getting the eminent domain, getting the, getting the cities to eminent domain the property. All right, you're gonna build a hotel, here's the deed. We clear it out, here's the deed. Now build your place. They'd save it for two years and then sell it. See what was going on? Isn't that terrible? Isn't that terrible? I know. So that to me was the most tragic Supreme Court decision I know I've ever seen in real estate. Okay. Anyways, inverse condemnation is when they take your property if you don't think they gave you enough money. Oh my God, they didn't give me enough money. You're going to sue the entity. I've never seen anybody feel like they got enough money. And I've seen two inverse condemnation suits where it ended up costing the ex-homeowner more than what they were going to get by the time it got closed out. 
So good luck. You also have a thing called reverse condemnation. Reverse condemnation is when, I'll give you a true case. Uh, I, had, I had a client, his name was, he's dead, so I can tell you his real name. His name was Dan Brown. Don't we have obligations to never reveal any information about him till they die, then their contract's done. So his name, <laughs> his name was Dan Brown. He was a friend of Jeff's. He was a real estate broker, but he specialized in high rises. And he knew, like I know, I do not, I don't even sell my own house because I can't sell a house. My real estate is in apartments it, from, I started with two units to four units, and then my clients got bigger, but my majority was two to four units. All right, and we'll talk about that a little later. I can't sell my own house. I can't sell houses. I cannot sell, I yell at people. <laughs> I, do. I do. I do. And investors can handle it, but like homeowners can't handle it. All right, so anyways. Can you share your screen? What? what was that? Share your screen. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> I apologize. Thank you for saying something. I apologize for that. So anyways, if on this little pink house thing, let me just, just show them the picture of this property. Oh. Welcome back. A Connecticut resident uh, lost his home in a Supreme Court eminent domain. Room that house there. Famously. The city of New London used eminent domain to get that land, promising Look, it would be little pink house. to create shop. All right, so sorry, I didn't know you guys couldn't see that. All right, so so Dan Brown, he was, a, he was an amazing investing guy. He was a real estate broker. He would represent conglomerates that owned high rises in California, Chicago, wherever, wherever they were. And everyone knew, everyone knew to call Dan if they had something big like that. Plus, he was like the quintessential self-made millionaire where he knew and i don't know where he learned it but he learned it at a young age obviously where people don't get rich on one source of income you don't get rich on just having a job you have to have multiple sources of income so he had the he was a broker for high rises plus when he would do a transaction part of his transaction would be a lease for a complete floor of a high rise whatever floor and he would he's the guy that came up with the concept of getting off an elevator on some floor and in the center would be a, uh, a receptionist or a couple receptionists and then maybe a conference room over here and then the perimeter of the building would be like one and two persons offices and they would be rented for very little money but they would have a very prestigious address and they would have their own phone lines and all the phone lines came into that one or two receptionists that would answer the phone for everybody in the perimeter okay so he's the first one that came up with that concept he also, he owned a bunch of those, so that was his monthly, a lot of monthly income coming there. Plus, he also was one of the first people to, uh, when the internet came about, to go about and buying relay station buildings. Because basically, when we get online, we first, our stuff goes to a building locally. I know mine goes to Dunn Iberville somewhere. I don't know where the building is. And then from there, it shoots out into the, into the World Wide Web. So those buildings, relay stations are all over the world. And so he just built bought a bunch of warehouses like all over the country and sold them as relay stations to all these people. So he, the guy just, he had, he had uh, this thing called anticipation, which is on the test on real estate where I swear he had a crystal ball and what was going to happen. This guy was amazing. For, for years, we saw him buying desert land and all these like uh, environmentalists were saying, you can't build here because of the turtles. No one's seen a turtle in like 30 years. And they go, there's our point. <laughs> you can't even find them anymore. But he ended up buying all this like desert land. We're like, what on earth are you doing? And it was like, like 10 years later, a freeway was built. An extension was built from Vegas to somewhere. And he ended up owning all the land, all the land at the exits. And he built gas stations. I mean, come on, who knew that? <laughs> that was like amazing. Well, anyways, on a reverse condemnation suit, when he was one of our, he was our client, I met him because he wanted to do four units, seven units, 12 units type stuff. So I became his income property broker, even though he was a broker. When I sell my house, I hire one of you. 
to sell my house, even though we're broke, or have you guys do it. I can't do it. Okay, so I, I stay within my specialty area, which is also a test question. Okay, so anyways, when Dan Brown was one of my, uh, one of my clients on TV, there was this old man that came on, and in his neighborhood, his entire neighborhood was eminent domain. And what happened was Los Angeles County decided to put three freeways, like one, one, two, and then another one here. And they eminent domain that entire neighborhood. And his neighborhood was like in the center of the freeway where they didn't need his airspace and they didn't need his land. So they left him alone. They did not eminent domain his property. And he kept trying to do reverse condemnation. He was trying to get the county to take his property because he was like the last one left. And he ended up, when Dan Brown finally saw it, he saw it on, um, it was like a show, like, you guys ever see those, those human interest stories on the news, like four on your side, two on your side, where they'll talk, they'll, somebody who feels like they're getting screwed, they'll go interview. And it, you know, it's usually like a David and Goliath type story where they'll interview the little guy. Well, anyways, that guy was on a uh, special like that on TV news and Dan Brown saw him. He was like, I'm the only one here. They're building this three freeway interchange. I'm right smack dab in the middle. They eminent domain my entire neighborhood and they won't reverse condom, you know, condemnation my property. What am I going to do? It's so loud. I'm here alone. So Dan knocked at the guy's door. All right. Remember, this property is like in the center of three high rise elevated freeways you guys ever see those elevated freeways where three come in the center dan ended up giving that old guy more than what his neighbors got for the eminent domain and he bought the property and he just let it sit there and it took years a couple years maybe three years before the freeway interchange was completed dan's first business was an insurance company that he handed off to his stepson he ended up when that freeway finished he painted that little building pink and put his little insurance company sign up there and then got three high-rise billboards that hit all three freeway he had the best advertising space in los angeles county and he ended up selling that property he made over a million dollars on that property <laughs> so so reverse condemnation was that guy that was trying to get the state to take it Anticipation is also on the exam, which there's some people, you're going to find some of these real estate people, you probably already found a few that you think have crystal balls that can look into the future that buy the most unlikely things. So those are your two concepts. But anyways, reverse condemnation, I'm going to ask you, who's the only one that can do reverse condemnation? Who do you think it is? The homeowner or the property owner. That's right. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, the last, oh, the second to the last police power is taxes. We have ad volarum. Look familiar? According to value. Okay, those are your property taxes. Who, who pays a special assessment? Those who benefited, right? Those who benefited from the improvement. That's right. I'm gonna build a school in this school district. They build a school in that school district. Who gets an extra tax? The people that go to the school. That's people. The people that go to the school. That's right. The, the people actually, uh, the whole neighborhood, they yeah. excellent. Okay. <laughs> the people that benefited from the improvement. S cheat is the last police power. S cheat. I've only seen this once where somebody dies, they own stuff and they die and they don't have a will. Excuse me. And they don't have any relatives. What do you do with their property? Anybody see the word cheat? The state cheats you out of your property. They take it. They take out the police power of his cheat. If they may ask you why would they take it, your answer is going to be because land cannot be ownerless. Land cannot be ownerless. Okay, that's very good. You guys are like a chapter ahead for sure. You guys will end up slowing down because you'll feel more comfortable as this class goes on. We'll have more communication. Okay. What's your homework for tonight? Um, to go look and see oh, what brokers. brokers. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited! You guys, pay attention. That's awesome. Yeah, that's right. Uh, look up Google what to ask a broker, and if you can help her, I know leave you uh, you too shy. Um, if, <laughs> if you can help me with the questions to ask brokers when interviewing, I want to get you set up. All right, here's the deal. 
We have plenty of time to give you the information to pass the exam. And then it becomes, I put it on you. I throw you the ball and say, now, like Brandy said, it's your time. You have to study it. Hey, I'm telling you what's on the test. Now you have to study it. That's easy. And we, and we can do that definitely in less than 60 hours. But at the same time, since we have extra time, I want you guys to prepare and think about yourself in real estate in your future. All right, so we're going to talk about what you should ask a broker. I want you to think about things that you want to have your first year of real estate. Your first year of real estate, it is your foundation. All right, so start thinking about things that you want. And as this class goes on, we're going to, or I'm going to try to inspire in you ways of taking care of you. I am so tired of seeing 60 year old, 70 year old brokers who cannot retire because they spent their entire 50 year career making other people wealthy without ever buying anything for themselves or ever considering themselves. And I said earlier today, just a few minutes ago, that to be a, a most self made millionaires have more than one source of income. I want you to start thinking about maybe getting yourself some passive income. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. All right. You guys good? Do you want that extra source of income so that you can retire? Okay, I don't want to see any more brokers not being able to retire or doctors. I can't tell you how many broke doctors came to my office trying to buy stuff when it was they had nothing left. All right. So, anyways, any questions? See you tomorrow at nine. And don't think you're getting out early every day like this. It's just that you're really ahead. And no one asks a lot of questions. Um, you guys, we do have a night class starting tonight, so please take everything with you. And just, you know, straighten up. Like, you have a coat for a long time. And you guys online, I'll be right here. Hello. You guys have any questions? Uh, I actually have one. Okay. Um, is the exam or the final for this class, is it in person? No, we, we have electronic formats that you guys can take or you can take, we'll, we'll give you options for sure. You don't have to come in to do it. Okay. And uh, also, so from my understanding, the license process is complete this class fill out the application and attach the diploma for the class to it, uh, take the national and state exam. And is that it? Um, yeah, you schedule it and then take it and pass it. And then if you don't have a broker, you have 10 days to find a broker after you pass the exam. And then you go learn real real estate. <laughs> well, I, was, I was looking at the uh, application and it has the, the broker uh, section on it. So we can fill that out before. Yeah, if that's line four. Absolutely. You can, you can keep that entire section blank on your broker. And you guys, you know how it says on the bottom of the first page, it says, what have you been doing in the last five years? Um, even if you, if you took like five days off between jobs, put in those five days, because if there's even one day missing, they're going to send that back to you. So just say, you know, stayed home or whatever. There can be no gaps in time at all. Right. And so does a student count for that? Too? Oops, I just lost you. Uh, does, does a student count uh, yeah, for that? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Student, uh, homemaker, anything, stayed home. You just, you cannot have anything blank. Yes, well, thank you. Okay, anything else you guys? Nope. All right. Nope. All right. I'll see you tomorrow at nine o'clock and we'll talk about um, picking a broker and things to ask them. Awesome. Have a good day. Yeah. yeah. They're yours. Those are yours. That's up two weeks off from a full time job.